Hello and welcome to Washington Talk. I'm Eun Jung Cho. Both the Republican and Democratic platforms for 2024 omit any mention of the goal of the denuclearization of North Korea. Today we discuss whether the U.S. is shifting its focus away from complete denuclearization. We'll also find out how to neutralize North Korea's new attack drones and rocket launchers. I know that our South Korean allies are also keeping an eye on it and, and monitoring that. In the studio with me, Mr. Robert Peters, the Nuclear Deterrence and Missile Defense Fellow at the Heritage Foundation. Mr. Peters served as the lead strategist at the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. He was also the Special Advisor for Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction in the Office of the Secretary of Defense. Also joining us, Colonel David Maxwell, the Vice President of the Center for Asia-Pacific Strategy. Colonel Maxwell was a former military planner for the ROC U.S. Combined Forces Command. Welcome to the program. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Now, Mr. Peters, in a memoir of his time in the Trump administration, Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster recalled then-Korean President Moon Jae-in in a meeting with Vice President Pence and others, saying that just like Saddam Hussein and Muammar Gaddafi, Kim Jong-un believed that he needed nuclear weapons for defense. Now, what is your take on this long-standing assertion from Korean progressives that Kim Jong-un needs, North Korea needs nuclear weapons for defense? I, I simply don't buy it. Um a power that is concerned about defense, that is peaceful and simply trying to secure their own nation, doesn't do things like issue threats to incinerate South Korean and American and Japanese cities. A defensive power doesn't engage in actions like testing nuclear-capable ballistic missiles over Japan. A defensive power doesn't engage in activities such as sinking the Chonan. Um, we have to believe um, that, that North Korea has these weapons because Sure, they have some defensive purpose, but I think they also want to engage in nuclear coercion, which is when, which is what they are doing when they test nuclear-capable ballistic missiles and threaten to incinerate civilian population centers. Um, you have to look at the totality of their actions and statements. Colonel Maxwell. Yeah, I absolutely agree with everything they said. And I would add that uh, really we're describing a short-term view and really an uninformed view of history, the history of North Korea. And Kim, Kim Il-sung started in the 1950s the pursuit of nuclear weapons, uh, sending 250 scientists uh, to Moscow to get PhDs, their first uh, experimental uh, nuclear reactor in 1962 with Soviet help. Uh, and then, you know, they have developed uh, their nuclear weapons uh, and pursued them all of this time, long before Gaddafi and Saddam Hussein ever existed uh, or in, were in power. Uh, furthermore, when Wang Zhengyap defected in 1997, uh, he told us uh, that uh, they understood they could not win a war against South Korea with U.S. support and that the U.S. would use nuclear weapons against the North if they attacked the South, which tells us our declaratory policy worked at that time. But it also explains why they have been pursuing nuclear weapons. And it is not for defense. It is to win the war. And that, I think, is really uh, most important. North Korea's uh, objective is to dominate the Korean Peninsula. It always has been and it always will be. And nuclear weapons are really a part of that. They pursue advanced nuclear weapons uh, for war fighting, but also, as uh, Bob said, uh, to be able to have coercive diplomacy. It's political warfare and blackmail diplomacy strategies. So uh, nuclear weapons are very advantageous for the North, uh, but they are ultimately for winning a war, not for defense. 
So, Mr. Peters, this idea that North Korea needs nuclear weapons for defense is, is followed by assertion that, therefore, the United States should address North Korea's security concerns. Can the United States militarily and diplomatically address another country's security concerns completely? And can any country have full confidence of its security? You know, I don't think any country can ever fully address the security control, uh, concerns of another country, uh, either with allies, by trying to assure them that, that you're a viable member of that alliance, but in particular with potential adversaries. That's just simply not possible. I think you can look across history and, and no country can ever be fully assured that another country doesn't have ill or malign designs on those countries. And, and, and so for that reason, um, I don't think, you know, there's nothing the United States could do to fully convince North Korea that we have no malign intentions toward them or we have no offensive intentions towards them. Just as there's, there's, there's almost nothing that North Korea could do that would convince us that they don't have malign intentions on South Korea, given their 70 years of statements and actions against our allies in, in South Korea and against the United States itself. And so for that reason, I don't think you're ever going to get to a situation in which the Kim regime can't assure the United States enough that we're going to say, well, there, there's no reason for us to be there. They're, they've got no malign intentions towards the United States or our allies in South Korea, and, and therefore we should leave. No country can ever fully assure another country. So what North Korea wants is for U.S. troops to pull out from South Korea? Yes. Now, and, Colonel, and they want them to pull out so that they can then use force to dominate the Korean Peninsula. That's very important, I think, to understand. It is not to maintain the status quo or peace, but so that they can believe that they have a military advantage to dominate the peninsula. And Colonel Maxwell, in um, the memoir, H.R. McMaster describes the U.S. government's wariness over President Moon Jae-in's attempts to be the middleman between the United States and North Korea. How does U.S. government view um, South Korea's desire to be a mediator, which was expressed several times in the past, a mediator between the United States and North Korea? How can South Korea be a mediator of its ally, United States, and its adversary, North Korea, between the United States and China? Well, first, the answer is in your question. If you're allies, then you're with, then you're together. A uh, mediator, uh, you cannot serve as a mediator uh, between an ally and an adversary. Uh, but that administration is gone, and I think the two current administrations uh, and both in Seoul and Washington, value the strength of the Rock U.S. alliance. And I hope the next administrations uh, in both capitals do the same, uh, because that mediator uh, idea is counterproductive and, frankly, dangerous. Um, I, think that, uh, I think that that stems from really a lack of understanding of the nature, objectives, and strategy of the Kim family regime. Uh, and it really leads to kind of a fantasy approach uh, that you can mediate and that North Korea will somehow become a responsible member of the international community. And I think we all agree uh, so far in this discussion, that's not ever likely to happen. Mr. Peters, General McMaster also noted that some government officials argued that least risky and least costly way is to accept North Korea as a nuclear weapon state and then deter its use of nuclear weapons. While you were in the government, have you encountered those officials who would like to accept North Korea as a nuclear weapon state? Is there a growing consensus within the U.S. government that denuclearizing North Korea is not feasible and therefore it must focus on limiting further production and use? I, I mean, I think you have, to, you have to make the distinction between, you know, accepting North Korea as a nuclear weapon state and all that that entails diplomatically and so forth and kind of recognizing that North Korea is not going to get rid of its nuclear weapons until the Kim regime ends. And I think that's where we are. And I think the number of people that think that you can get to some kind of diplomatic or negotiated settlements in which both sides agree that, that North Korea should denuclearize, I mean, that community is vanishingly small. It's very small. I don't think we're ever going to get back to any kind of meaningful arms control discussions or denuclearization discussions with the Kim family. And I think what it comes down to is you're going to, you're going to try to deter North Korean nuclear coercion, and you're going to try to strangle and limit the program as much as you can. And I think that's where most American policymakers are today. Well, I must note that when you say that circle has vanished to a real small group, those who seek for a negotiated settlement with North Korea, I still need to, I think, remind everybody that 
you know, U.S. government stated goal is to denuclearize North Korea through negotiated uh, diplomacy. Um, Colonel Maxwell, former senior Pentagon official, was on this program and said that denuclearization was an unrealistic goal and that we lived in a lie for 20 years and that we should be realistic by now. Um, there is a growing perception that the U.S. government's goal has shifted from denuclearization to just managing the situation and preventing war through extended deterrence. Is that the reality that we're in? Well, the, the correct part of that statement is we must have extended deterrence uh, to deter war, and, and that, that is true. However, our denuclearization policy has failed for the last 30 years. Uh, and it's failed because of our, our erroneous assumptions about the nature, the objectives and strategy of the Kim family regime. Uh, and people believed that Kim Jong-un would negotiate in good faith as a responsible member of the international community. And we applied international relations theory uh, to the situation when Kim Jong-un does not act as a responsible member of uh, the international community. Um, and so it is not that it was a lie, uh, but there is a recognition, as, as Bob said, I absolutely believe this, there will be no end to the nuclear threat until uh, there is no more Kim family regime. And so now we're at a point where we need to continue deterrence, we need to continue our military readiness, we need to continue our, our alliance, uh, uh, sustaining our alliances in the region, but now it's time to shift to another policy and a recognition that while denuclearization is a worthy goal, uh, it's not feasible as long as Kim Jong-un is in power. And so the traditional uh, thought has always been denuclearize and then unify. Well, it's time to flip that conventional wisdom on its head and start thinking about achieving unification as the path to denuclearization. And we're fortunate now uh, that uh, the Camp David summit, uh, the three leaders of Japan, South Korea, and the United States uh, pledged support for a free and unified Korea. And now on August 15th, uh, President Yoon unveiled the 815 Unification Doctrine, uh, which is really designed uh, to bring change inside North Korea based on freedom, democracy, uh, the rule of law, and human rights. And this is really the opportunity. And the next administration for the U.S., um, whether it's Republican or Democrat, should fully support that plan uh, while maintaining all of our military capabilities and deterrence capabilities to prevent war. Change must occur in North Korea for there to be denuclearization and peace. Colonel Maxwell, one of our reporters, VOA reporters, asked the deputy representative of North Korea at the UN mission a few years ago whether North Korea has the will to denuclearize. And the person replied, when United States denuclearizes and when the whole world denuclearizes, then we'll think about it. Now, when North Koreans are thinking like this, would diplomacy and pressure be able to denuclearize North Korea, if, especially if this is a long-term goal? Don't we need something else other than diplomacy and uh, deterrence and pressure against North Korea? Right. Well, what the uh, representative was really telling us uh, was that they have no intention to denuclearize. And when they say denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, we know there's no nuclear weapons in South Korea now. Uh, we want to denuclearize North Korea. But from their perspective, it's denuclearization of the entire peninsula to include the removal of all nuclear access to the forces in South Korea, which means the removal of U.S. troops. That's what, that is the political warfare that North Korea is conducting. And we have to conduct a superior form of that. But now, in addition to deterrence, uh, in addition to diplomacy, we have to focus on change in North Korea. That's why public diplomacy and information is so important. A focus on human rights up front is so important. And because it is only change inside North Korea that will bring an end to the nuclear program and the human rights abuses. If I could just follow on, um, it, it, it's actually the North Korean perspective of denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula actually includes the American nuclear umbrella over South Korea. That's right. So when they say That's that right. they want denuclearization of the total of the total peninsula, what they're talking about is the United States explicitly renouncing its extended nuclear umbrella over South Korea. That's what they're talking about. And Japan. And, and, and so that's, I mean, that's not in the cards. Yeah. And, and so that's why it's a non-starter for us. And I think David's also correct when he says, to have these kind of diplomatic negotiations, you have to have a willing partner. We have 30 plus years of data showing that the Kim family is not a willing partner to engage in meaningful denuclearization instructions. So Mr. Peters, at a time when the U.S. focus seems to be more towards deterrence 
and more towards preventing the war. At the same time, it seems like the United States is also opening up a lot of um, options and possibilities in protecting and defending South Korea. In your latest report on nuclear posture review, you said that the U.S. should discuss with Japan and Korea to reintroduce tactical nuclear weapons into the theater to deter North Korea and China. Now, a growing number of U.S. experts on this program are also becoming more open to this idea as well. We sense the change. Now, are we moving in this direction where the United States is expanding options for South Korea's defense, including tactical nuclear weapons? So I, I think that what you see is in Washington, a lot of policymakers are concerned about um, expanding adversary capabilities to include the North Korean arsenal, which continues to mature and expand, as well as the breathtaking Chinese nuclear expansion. And when they look at that broad scenario in, in East Asia, they say, you know, we've got a real problem. We don't have enough actual capabilities, military capabilities, to deter possible coercion or even nuclear deployments on the part of North Korea and China. Therefore, perhaps it's time to reverse the decisions of the early 1990s in which we withdrew all theater nuclear weapons from the region. And I think that's where a lot of people are. I certainly am. And so I, I think that there's a number of folks who believe that it is time to reopen those nuclear weapon storage sites in South Korea, reintroduce American nuclear weapons into the peninsula that could be employed in times of crisis by American pilots flying American planes. Um, in addition to potentially theater nuclear weapons that are deployed on, on American ships at sea or that could be employed from bombers that are generated out of North America. And so I think you're seeing a growing, uh, I would not call this the consensus, but I think you see a growing recognition that we have to change our deterrence posture within the theater. Among those who also believe that the United States should redeploy tactical nuclear weapons into the theater are uh, Senator James Risch and Senator Roger Wicker. Now, Colonel Maxwell, I specifically remember we had the conversation about a couple years ago that you said there's no military utility in redeploying tactical nuclear weapons to Korea. Yeah, I, you know, at the time, uh, I, I really did not see uh, at, at the time, but what what, what is happening is, and a, and a good thing that's happening, is that our military planners are developing multiple options. And, and that's what they owe our national security leaders, uh, our multiple options. And I think what uh, Bob has laid out here are, you know, is the threat from both North Korea and China and multiple options. And I defer to the nuclear experts on that. Uh, the, the reason I said that at the time is that I believe that we, and I still believe, we have the nuclear capability uh, to, to target North Korea uh, with our current weapons around the world, uh, from the United States, uh, and and uh, and we can do that. However, uh, what what Bob and other experts are laying out are better options uh, that uh, that enhance our deterrence, uh, and then the tactical utility. Uh, the other the other part of it also is that we have many conventional weapons that could be used in lieu of nuclear weapons. Uh, but given the nuclear threat from North Korea, I think it's imperative that we have the full range of options. And so I, I will, you know, I have adjusted my, my thinking based on new evidence and, and listening to experts. Now, there's been some new developments regarding North Korea's weapons this week. And Mr. Peters, according to an exclusive VOA Korea report, we reported that North Korea has registered 13 submarines with International Maritime Organization. Now, the, they registered warships a few times before, but for the first time, submarines. And IMO deleted all the information a day after VOA reported on this. Now, it is unclear why now they register with IMO and why only a few out of 70 submarines that North Koreans have. What is your take? So I'm, I'm becoming increasingly concerned over the cooperation between Russia and North Korea. Um, you're seeing this in uh, the North Korean support for Russia's war in Ukraine, uh, providing munitions. I'm becoming increasingly concerned that the quid pro quo for that is that Russia is providing tactical assistance to help the North Korean missile program and potentially as well the miniaturization of the nuclear warhead. What you could see is ever closer relationships between North Korea and Russia, in which you could see possible joint exercises between the two nations, which could include maritime exercises. And so one explanation for this could be that North Korea is trying to lay the groundwork so that North Korean submarines could operate in the Western Pacific in conjunction with the Russian Navy and doing some kind of joint operations. It's hard to say it, the, the report was broken, as you mentioned, only a couple days ago, um, but it's really concerning. And Mr. Peters, Kim Jong-un watched new suicide drones destroying test targets, and the DOD said that 
we clearly want to take that threat seriously. How capable are North Korea's suicide drones and what will their purpose be? And people say they resemble Russia's Lancet. Yeah, so there's some evidence that, that they're similar to, to some drones that have been employed by Russia in the Ukraine war. There's some evidence that they're similar to the Shahid drones that Iran has, has built and that's also providing to Russia in the war. I think what you're seeing is, again, with this theme of the authoritarians in Pyongyang and Moscow and potentially Tehran working together, sharing technology, trying to help the other side become more capable, um, you know, in opposition to, to the United States, its allies around the world. What can these things be used for? Um, for, my, for me, it comes to, down to two points. One, they have some utility, as has been seen in Ukraine, against um, targets that are tanks, self-propelled artillery, and so forth. But, but in some ways, even more concerning is they could be used to overwhelm South Korean missile defenses. And basically, they send in these cheap suicide drones to be able to overwhelm or potentially even target North, um, sorry, South Korean missile interceptors, destroy them, and then you can fire more capable missiles as a follow-on to try to hit more high-value targets. And Colonel Maxa, what are the ways to neutralize these thousands of drones flying to Korea? Well, it's it's a real challenge because uh, the large numbers really do, can overwhelm defenses. You know, I have to give the North Korean People's Army credit. They're they're studying as they always have conflicts around the world. They're adapting, uh, taking the best practices. However, I think that. Uh, um, there are ways to, uh, to defend against them, um, and, and we're developing those in the United States, but also South Korea. And I believe South Korea is on a path to develop what could be a, a really cutting-edge uh, laser capability uh, to defend against drones, and, and that will be a game-changer. Uh, and South Korea has got the technical know-how and the expertise to be able to do that, and I hope that they're able to accomplish that soon. Mr. Peters, North Korea also tested upgraded 240 millimeter rocket launcher system. The existing model is over 40 years old and has been criticized for being outdated in terms of explosive power, accuracy, and range. Now, given the images and North Korean comments, do you think this is a significant advancement? And does it go beyond the threat of turning Seoul into a sea of fire? You know, um, the, the Korean People's Army, and, and I defer to David, I mean, he knows much more about it than I do. They've got a lot of really old equipment, and um, you, you know, upgrading 40-year-old technology is something that militaries do all the time. Um, it is it is somewhat more concerning, to be sure, but I don't think that this is something that we should be overly concerned about. Um, this is 40 years is about the life cycle for a weapon system such as this, and they're just kind of doing what militaries do. But I mean, welcome your thoughts. Yeah, and of course, in the Soviet Union in the past, and, and the Russians, you know, they never threw anything away. You know, they just keep uh, keep yeah. sustaining it, and uh, again, because quantity has a quality all its own. So they they employ old and new. And Colonel Maxwell, are these drones and suicide drones and artillery shells are these for expert purposes for Russia? Well, I think uh, North Korea will sell anything to anyone to make money, and I think they've shown that. Uh, I think they've sh sold everything in their arsenal short of nuclear weapons yet. Uh, and so I, I think that that certainly has to be a concern uh, that they would do that. But I think also, you know, as Bob was mentioning, this cooperation, collaboration uh, among what Christopher Ford calls the dark quad, these, you know, this axis of dictators and tyranny, um, is, is really troubling. And I think the, the Russia-North Korea uh, relationship, um, as well as China and Iran, these four countries um, are really basing these relationships on, on four things. Uh, and that's fear, uh, weakness, desperation, and envy. They fear the alliances of the free world. Uh, they are far superior. Uh, they are desperate for support. Well, that's all the time we have for this week. Colonel Maxwell, Mr. Peters, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. And thank you for watching. We'll be back here next week with U.S. experts to discuss the two Koreas and the region right here from Washington.